really stories are crucial for our survival. So we need to learn from our parents about what's dangerous in the world. We need to avoid uh, motorbikes crashing into us or um, you know, dogs that are looking very dangerous <laughs> that might bite us. We need to learn from our parents and from our family. As children, we need to learn to avoid those dangers. Strangers can be dangerous and we need to learn uh, not to just go up to them with an open heart and say, oh, hello, um, because sometimes strangers can be dangerous. So it's really important that we learn that. But sometimes in our present society, we overlearn that. So we think everything in life is dangerous. And so we think all strangers are dangerous. And the truth is, there's very few strangers who are dangerous. <laughs> there's, most people have good hearts and good intentions. And it's, it's highly unlikely that strangers will be dangerous. So we overlearn that. And so within um, psychology, w the way that I look at things is that the stories that we have in our head, some of them serve a purpose, but some of them actually are very, uh, I was going to say nefarious stories, because that's one of the titles of one of, one of our sessions later. Some of the, s the stories we hold in our head are not serving our highest purpose. They make us suspicious of people when really we should be open-hearted. And so what, what I've learned is that um, inside our head we have, we have stories that are about our past. Stories about how our parents treated us badly or well how our siblings treated us, um, how competent we were. Did we learn how to ride a bike, for example? Did we learn uh, well at school? Did we get A's or F's in our school uh, essays? Are we competent or are we incompetent? We learn all of these things and we create stories that are more or less true. Very often they're not true, but we have these stories that continue to replay in our head. Some of these stories become ruminations where we go, oh, my father doesn't love me. Oh, my father's a bad man or my father's mean to me, but he's kind to my brother. Those ruminations can eat away at our soul. And um, so we need to change those stories. But the first thing to do is to recognize that those stories are there, that they exist. Because most of it, we're never taught in school, oh, Watch out, you have stories in your head that could be helpful for you, but they could also be really bad for you. <laughs> you need to, we need to become aware of that. And we need to be aware that um, we can change those stories. Sometimes stories can be very difficult to change, but sometimes they can just you know, be changed in a second, in a flash. So, for example, uh, if you see a glass that's got water in it, someone would look at it and say, oh, that's a half empty glass. And if you say, no, 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 it's not, it's half full. You've changed in one second the person's perception. So some people um, remember all their failures in life. They think, oh, I'm not a very clever person or I'm not a very successful person. But then if they remember, actually, do you remember that time when you helped that elderly lady crossing the street? And they go, oh, oh yeah, I did do that. You go, okay. That was a really successful thing that you did. That was amazing. That, to me, says you're actually a good person. Then they remember, oh, yeah, I've helped my mother every day in the kitchen or I've helped my father to carry logs or whatever it is. And they start to build themselves a picture that, actually, I'm a really good person and I, I can do amazing things. And it's a little bit like when you have... Um, you know, say this isn't probably a very good analogy, but say if you have poker chips <laughs> playing in a casino, if you um, only have a few chips where you go, oh, I'm fairly clever, not very clever, got another chip, oh, well, I'm quite good looking, but not very good looking, another chip that says, oh, I'm quite good. You don't have many chips to play with in life. But if you have another person who has a pile of chips that says, okay, I can ride a bike, I'm kind to my mother, I'm kind to my brothers and sisters. I actually take good care of how I dress and how I keep myself clean. I go to the mosque or go wherever. Um, I take care of strangers. I'm So they have a pile of chips that's like 20, 20 tall, whereas the other person who has 
maybe less good stories about themselves. They have a very small pile of chips to play with in their life. The one who has 20 chips, who is going to take risks? Who is going to do things with their life? Who's going to follow their dreams? Because they can use those chips in their life to do amazing things. The one with four or five chips is going to say, oh, well, I'm not so good. I don't think I'll dare to uh, set up a business or I don't dare ask that beautiful girl out because maybe she will reject me and I can't risk losing my chips. And then the other guy or woman who has 20 chips will go, I can do anything. I've got 20 chips. I can set up a business. I can go to university and study. I can give somebody a few of my chips. I can help other people. So their life is going to be totally different from the person who's just focused on the negatives in their life. So the other way, so that's a one way of changing your life is um, focusing on really remembering how great you are, noticing the good things about yourself and improving yourself if you, if you can't find that many things. You know, you can, even if you just brush your teeth, that's a good thing, that's a chip. That adds on to your layer, of your little pile of chips. Um, if you just get up out of bed, if you've perhaps been depressed and stayed in bed, or you, you know, you, uh, if you don't, um, if you stop drinking, if you have an alcohol issue, if you don't drink for one day, that's an extra chip for you. You've done something really great. Another way of changing is, is a system that I've learned in the last few years, which is called internal family systems. And this is a way of starting to learn about ourselves, to really get to see the stories that are going on in our heads in a much clearer way. So all of us have multiple stories. And in this um, system by Richard Schwartz called Internal Family Systems, we learn that we have parts that are trying to help us. So, for example, you have a part that brought all your equipment here and got yourself on time to the World Storytelling Cafe. You had a part that got yourself dressed and made yourself look beautiful. And you have a part that's kind enough, you want to share messages throughout the world. So those are all, in my way of thinking, those are all parts of you. And they're all good. They're all trying to help you. They all want you to have a wonderful life and to be successful. But some people, in fact most of us, have some parts that we may not like. So, for example, I have a part that criticizes me and says, oh, you don't look so good, or oh, you're, you're getting old, you're not walking quite as easily as you did. And, oh, you didn't do such a great job in that lecture or that talk or whatever. Or if I'm doing therapy, oh, you, you helped that client a certain amount, but you could have done much better. So that critic pops up again and again. And I have worked on it, but it still comes up. <laughs> it's quite a strong critic. So what you can do is identify all those parts of you that you like and parts that you don't like, and just welcome them. So my critic is actually a bit of a friend now. I go, oh, okay, it's you again. Yeah, I know you're trying to do your very best for me. I know you want the best for me. I know you're trying to protect me from shame and feeling embarrassed. I know you're trying to keep me small so I don't become arrogant. I know that. But please, could you just, for an hour or two, just step to one side and soften back and let me be in um, a central place, which for anybody who's religious, that place is like when you're with Allah, when Allah is speaking with you and, and allows uh, his presence to be with you. And for me, um, it's when I allow every, everything about creation to just come into my heart and I feel peaceful and full of love and kindness. So once you've discovered all your parts and you can have a conversation with your parts, you learn about them and what's the question that therapists ask these parts is what is your job? If the part doesn't have a job, then they're not a protector part, they're something else. So when they say, oh yeah, I've got a job, my job is to stop you from getting arrogant, so I have to criticize you all the time. I don't want you to be vain, so I tell you that you're not looking pretty. That's my job. And then I'll say, thank you so much for doing that job, because I know you're just trying to help me. 
And then it's this is all in your mind. It might make it sound like you're crazy, <laughs> but you're not. This is this is what lots of people have discovered is happening inside our heads. So then you ask the protector part. So I'd ask the critic. So would you mind if I was able to explore the part of me that you're protecting? Sometimes the protectors take a while to really accept that, but usually they will accept that and they'll soften back or they'll go and wait in a waiting room and then they'll allow me access to the child that's holding that pain of feeling um, unattractive or feeling old or whatever. So then you explore that child and you it's called befriending. You make friends with that child. Sometimes they are non-verbal. You know, sometimes they're very, very young and they can't talk to you. But very often they will talk to you. And it's as if I was talking to you. It's like talking to another person, a little person. So I'll say, so what do you need to the child? And the child in my system, very often the child will say, I need a hug from you. I need you to notice me. I want you to hug me and to tell me that you love me. So then I will do that. And the child starts to usually will start to warm up and soften and become happier. And then I will talk to the child and find out what's happened. What's happened to you? Why is it that you're feeling like this? And they will tell me a story. And this is how it relates to storytelling. They will tell me a story that I perhaps did not know or maybe I'd forgotten. Sometimes I go, oh, yeah, I remember that now. Yeah, yeah, somebody told you you were too big for your boots. That's, that's right, that happened to me. And you heal that child and bring them into your body, your heart, or somewhere near to you. And then, in your mind, again, it's in your imagination, you take care of that child day after day after day. So I have quite a lot of children, and they were living in my heart, but one of them said, why don't we make a beautiful playground and so I now have in my imagination <laughs> people might think this is crazy but it works I have a playground that is beautiful it's full of flowers it's it's a garden and it's, it has a beach it ha actually has a bandstand where one of my little girls um, who was uh, shy is now dancing and dancing with joy and inviting other people to dance I have some protectors that are lying on a beach, relaxing because they've been working so hard and they're exhausted. And now they realize they don't have to work so hard protecting me because now I'm connecting more with that part of me that is with Allah or with nature. I have a part that's um, gardening, that's, uh, that's watering flowers. And that's what she loves to do. And that part is about eating healthy food. And she now knows that uh, when I <laughs> eat things that are not healthy for me, that that is not healthy for her. So she's constantly watering flowers. And I go and see her and sometimes she'll say, do you know what, some of my flowers have died. And that's because you ate some sugar in your uh, hot chocolate and that's really bad for you. So please don't. And then I'll go, I'm really sorry, I forgot. And I, I won't, I won't do that. And that reminds me, I need to take care of all of these children. And I know it sounds crazy to people who haven't done this, but I've worked with so many uh, people who've been depressed, anxious, thought that they had a label like borderline personality disorder or um, other worse labels. And I've, when they find the family that's within them, the internal family, they're able to heal and um, they're able to actually enjoy being themselves. And it's, apart from anything, it's the most fun therapy that I've ever done. You now, hypnotherapy is great fun and I love it. And um, it's very relaxing for me while I'm doing it with people. And when I was doing a type of therapy called psycho psychodynamic therapy, it's fascinating looking at relationships between different people in the family. But, but with internal family systems, it's, 
just a joy to do it. Um, and even when people are exploring the most painful things, you know, maybe they've been seriously abused or been in a tragic accident, they've lost family members who they loved, they may have lost a child. Even when they're exploring the most painful, awful situations that you would never wish on anybody, your worst enemy, they start to get an understanding and they start to heal. They find the children that have been injured, have been hurt, and th those children are so happy to come out of their prisons or their dungeons or their dark black caves where they're suffering, come and join in the heart with uh, the compassionate self, with the self that's allied with Allah and with nature and all of creation that's inside every single one of us, you know.